presentation. I have a FAR, which is a flat backside rule, and my rule is interrupt me when you wish. If you have a question, raise your hand, I'll call on you. And the reason for that is, is I don't want my audience to think of something, then forget it, right? So whenever you think of it, I can stop what I'm doing, and if you want me to pause my, my video, I don't always know what's being shown on the video. So if you see something on the video, or you, I, I say something, um, just raise your hand, and we will we'll address the question. It works very good that way. And I will also be showing you what I like to call bring brag items, stuff that I think is really neat, all right? So um, the more you ask me questions, the more you participate, the better. All right, yeah, good, everybody agree to that rule? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you, all right. Okay, so I'm gonna, give me a second, I'm gonna change the film, okay. Okay, um, beginning 1942, Sometime after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy realized that they needed a lot of aircraft carrier qualified pilots. So to do that, they needed a place to qualify them. And by 1942, there was plenty of uh, U-boats, U-boats, submarines, wolf packs off the East Coast, and the Japanese had really good submarines. So it was difficult to train, qualify a pilot to learn to land on an aircraft carrier when the training aircraft carrier has got a zigzag dodging torpedoes from a submarine. So what they did was they came up with an interesting idea. They decided they were gonna qualify their pilots out on Lake Michigan off of Chicago using two former side-wheeled steam-powered excursion vessels. Believe it or not, before World War II, you could go take a cruise on an excursion vessel on the Great Lakes for a week, like we do in the Caribbean and Hawaii and the Mediterranean. So they purchased two ships, the Greater Buffalo and the C&B, and they were very fancy ships. And they took the superstructures off, they took the fancy stuff out, and they put a wooden flat top. They were smaller than a fleet carrier, but they, beginning, in late 1942, they put the USS Wolverine, which you're looking at some, uh, both the Sable and the Wolverine, they put these two ships out on Lake Michigan, and between late 1942 and after VJ Day, they qualified nearly 15,000 pilots who went on to win the Pacific War. Additionally, they qualified deck crews, radar operators, all sorts of people. They trained them on board the ships. It was a very successful project, very successful program. Doing it, they were doing it quite rapidly. A modern day Navy pilot goes through unbelievable hours of training on simulators, all sorts of things. These pilots would go through about 300 hours of flight training and then have to take an aircraft with a big round engine and land it on an aircraft carrier. Not an easy thing to do. So in the process of qualifying nearly 15,000 pilots, there was about 130 aircraft that went into the water. Now they didn't Give all go into the water up if you've because got of good the pilots. Audio. They were running the aircraft very hard. To qualify that many pilots, they were running these aircraft very, a lot. So the maintenance was a problem. So some would have maintenance problems and go in the water. But about 130 went in the water. They had a diving operation that attempted to recover them. Our estimates are that they were about Perfect, 10 thanks. of them. So that left what we estimated 120 in, in the water. And when I was a young teenager, a scuba group located a TBF Avenger. The program was pretty much forgotten up until that point. So that scuba group recovered that TBF Avenger. About a year later, our group, which we later called A&T Recovery, 
we were really an ad hoc group of boys who grew up in the same Chicago area neighborhood, inner city neighborhood, who just liked to explore. We located a wildcat fighter. That wildcat fighter was recovered for a man named Telleger who had owned the 57 squadron restaurants that are near all the airports. The two primary um, people for AT Recovery, myself and Alan Olson, we went and did military service. And several years later, we came back and we decided that we were going to survey the southern basin of Lake Michigan to locate all those aircraft. Well, we became really good at it. And we started recovering aircraft for museums that would request an aircraft from us. And it was actually kind of simple for us. We'd locate the aircraft. The museum would make a request to what was called Nav Air. And Nav Air would say, sure, you can have that aircraft. And somewhere circa 1988, the New director of the National Naval Aviation Museum called us and said, you do that again, I'm putting you in prison. And, and we said, oh, wonderful, great. And he said, but what I want you to do is I want you to work for us. And he said, I don't have any money, though. So he said, well, how are we going to do that? And he said, what I have is this thing in law, Title 10, Section 2572, it allows me to exchange artifacts to enhance my museum. So he said, I will give you aircraft for the aircraft you recover from us. Well, we said, OK, sounds like a deal. Then he told us that's against the law. The reason that was against the law was because the Navy maintains title of its aircraft that it's lost. So. Oh. The law said that we had to exchange like item for like item. From the Navy legal point of view, we were exchanging a service for obsolete Navy aircraft. So it was against the law. Suddenly, we became lobbyists. And we had to get the law changed. You know, in the United States of America, if you don't like the law, what do you do? You change it, right? So we needed several words inserted in the law that said that we could exchange our service for their obsolete Navy equipment. And we got a representative who and, um, proposed the law, soon got a lot of sponsors, co-sponsors, took about two years and the law passed, and we put up a contract in place to recover an SB2U-2 Vought Vindicator and a Wildcat fighter. You guys saw the film just now, The Vindicator? You guys didn't know that was a Vindicator, did you? <laughs> you didn't know, did you? That was a Vought Vindicator, the skeleton. So anyway, we recovered that Vought Vindicator and Wildcat fighter. In return, we received two Wildcat fighters and an SBD Dauntless dive bomber, which we subsequently sold to private hands who restored them to flying. Okay. So um, from there, we moved on to other contracts. And all in all, we recovered approximately 40 aircraft on behalf of the National Naval Aviation Museum, Pensacola, Florida. And now they are on display throughout the entire country, from Long Island, New York, all the way across to San Diego, from way in Florida to all over the country. Here in Texas, there is one on display at the uh, USS Lexington Aircraft Carrier Museum, Corpus Christi. There's one on display at the Museum of the Pacific War. Or they used to call it the Admiral Nimitz Museum. They have one on display there. There's got to be a question. No question. All right. <laughs> All right, so I want to tell you, everybody on your table has, has some paperwork, right? So I have, a, I have a question for you guys. We use what's called side scan sonar. Does everybody know what a side scan sonar is? No. Anybody know? Yeah. Okay. You guys know what a fish finder is, right? Yeah. Okay. Basically, it's a fish finder turned horizontally. 
And what it does is it sends out a signal that it listens for an echo return, and then it draws a map of the bottom. So on your tables, if you look, so my question for you is, can anybody tell me what an aircraft airplane looks like on a side scan sonar? Take a look at what's on your table. Anybody tell me what an airplane looks like on a side scan sonar? Nobody has an answer? <laughs> it's a trick question. An airplane looks like an airplane, doesn't it? That's what airplanes look like on side scan sonars. Let me pause this for a second. I'm, I'm pausing that for a reason. That's a ship. <laughs> what do you think a ship looks like? There's a reason I'm pausing the video. I'll be right back. An airplane looks like an airplane. Uh, what's the other images you see are ships, basically. So I always like to pause on this photograph. I have another question for, for you guys. Who is the youngest aviator in naval aviation history? Anybody know? Go ahead. Who? who? Bush. Bush. Everybody agree? No. Probably, yeah. George Bush, absolutely false. Oh. Ted Williams. No. Okay. So these three gentlemen here interesting group of people, and I, I like to show this, okay? As you look at the photo on your left is Captain Grant Young. In the center, the man's name was Fred Turner, and on the right, as you view the photo, is Charles Downey. Charles Downey was the youngest aviator in naval aviation history. He was 17 days younger than George Bush. George Bush got to 90-something years old before he admitted it. And he sent Charles Downey, I've seen the letter, a letter admitting it. For all those years, he let everybody believe he was the youngest aviator, and he wasn't. The man on the left is Grant Young. Grant Young, on December 17, 1943, crashed in a TBF Avenger out on Lake Michigan. It's a great story. He, the crash rescue boat, he was standing on the wing of the aircraft as it was sinking. The crash rescue boat pilot pulled back on the throttles too fast. Anybody know what happens when you pull back on the throttles very quickly with most engines? They die. The engines of the crash boat died. The person on the deck told him to swim to the boat in skim ice. So in the 32 degree water. He swam to the boat. By the time he got to the boat, he uh, didn't have the energy to get, climb up the ladder of the boat to get in the boat. So they lassoed him and pulled him into the boat. Um, completely exhausted, he fell asleep. They, about two hours later, he arrived at Navy Pier, the dock. They put him in a Stokes litter, and good thing the deckhand tied a rope to the Stokes litter because they dropped him off the side back into the lake while he was strapped in the Stokes litter. Anyway, the whole thing cost him a delay in his training. He was scheduled to, be, to go to a squadron off of Seattle for submarine patrol. Instead, because he was late for that, he was rescheduled and sent to be a pool pilot in the Pacific. Circa April 1945, he put the torpedo in the Yamato battleship that sank it. That's the man who sank the Yamato battleship on your left. The man in the center is Fred Turner, who was the second CEO of McDonald's Corporation. McDonald's Corporation and Fred Turner have backed at least three of our recovery and restoration efforts. Anybody want to know why? Are you curious? Okay. When Fred Turner and Ray Kroc were building up the McDonald's franchise, 
to the, the corporation it is we know today, they were part of a group, a club. And I don't know exactly what they did. I guess they played golf or something, right? And in the club were a bunch of pilots from World War II. So to Ray Kroc and Fred Turner, those pilots saved and protected the world's liberty and freedom, which made it possible for them to take a hamburger stand idea and make it into an international corporation. So in honor of those pilots, Fred Turner and McDonald's back the projects we do to recover, to rescue, restore, and present to the American public the machines the greatest men and women of the greatest generation use to protect our liberty and freedom. That's why they support the project. Pretty cool. It's an American story, right? It's what we are as a people. I'll continue with the video. Somebody has to have a question for me. How many airplanes are in the lake? Um, <coughs> we estimate still there's 60 to 70. A lot of them are TBF, TBM Avengers. In what time period did they all go in the water? Uh, October 1942 to about October 1945. Okay. So people think that's a lot of aircraft, but when you look at the level of the training, and it, no, it's not. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a large number. Now, today we don't have, they don't have as many crashes because they spend, you know, who knows how many thousands of hours on simulators and <laughs> a lot more safety mechanisms that they were able to do. But those days they were, the pilots had about 300 hours of flying. That's not a lot of hours, especially because they, they would start in one type of airplane to, to learn to fly and then go to another type of aircraft. So they did have a lot of hours in the type of aircraft that they were flying. And, and then if you look at them, they're the huge round engines. You guys know, you're Vought, you're Vought people. They had the big, huge round engines. Hard to overcome the P factor, right? Not enough right If any of you sometimes. have questions, go ahead Things and ask like them. That. So very powerful engines and um, the, a lot of torque, right? So, so it's actually a very successful project. Go ahead. Are they fairly well in a, in a concentrated area or are they scattered all over the lake? No. Um, the southern basin from the Wisconsin border down to, well, to the south. If you, I don't know if you know the geography of Lake Michigan. You know, it lies in between Illinois, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan. Um, I always estimated our search area at 2,500 square miles. So you're looking for 100 and something aircraft in 2,500 square miles. So about an aircraft every 25 square miles. And that, that aircraft is 40 by 40 feet. <laughs> it's a lot of area for, for a tiny aircraft. What kind of depths are you uh, working at? Uh, originally, they were as shallow as 40 feet, but most of, most of the aircraft we recover are anywhere from 150 to 350 feet deep. So the southern basin is shallower than way up north in Lake Michigan, but um, now aircraft we're, look, we're working on are about 500 feet deep. Yeah. Go ahead. Did the Navy provide you with uh, any information as to where the, the responsible, or did the, hmm? the accident locations, I guess? No. The U.S. Navy, that's a very good question. Most people who wanted to compete with us thought that's what happened. They thought the Navy provided us the locations. Uh, that's not what happened. The ships had a log, yeah. and they logged, they logged. They logged the most interesting things on the ship's logs. If, if somebody was fined five or ten dollars, which was a lot of money in those days, that was registered in the log. One of the things they had, there was a new invention that helped them know their position. Can anybody guess what that was? The Al, yeah, no, Loran. What was it? <laughs> he said Loran, oh. Loran didn't come up to me. <laughs> no. Um, uh, Anybody know the technology that the Allies had that the Axis didn't have that would dealt with this sort of subject matter? Radar. Oh. So they, they had a secret device called radar. So they would get, let's call it a radar fix, set of radar fixes, um, and they would log those radar fixes. And that's what was in the log records. 
our competition using the same log records really wasn't able to find the aircraft. Why? There you go. Why? <laughs> adults think as adults. You agree, right? We don't think as adults. We think as boys. Children think differently than adults. Adults rationalize things. Boys think, what would I do? So the radar positions generally would have two or three fixes. So I think everybody understands the radar, how it makes it sweep, right? It's making a sweep, so an aircraft crashes in the lake. The radar's making the sweep. And the students, the instructor would have the students record the azimuth and, azimuth and distance to known points. For anybody who knows the geography of Lake Michigan, it might be St. Joseph Harbor entrance, Michigan City Harbor entrance, Chicago Harbor entrance, Waukegan Harbor entrance. What happened? Oh, my computer. Hang on. The um, Chicago Harbor entrance. Um, should start back up. Okay. So they would have, say, 32 miles at such and such heading to Chicago Harbor entrance and so many miles such and such heading to Michigan City. So the, the logical thing, an adult that takes that and charts that out or draws that out on a chart. So if you had three positions like that, what should you get for their intersection? Triangle. Ah, you're thinking like we do. Most people think a point can't be a point. Because the boat's moving, and every position, the boat, every fix, the boat's in a different position. So that's what you get. You get a triangle. So where would you search for the ship, or for the aircraft, the lost aircraft? In the triangle. That's what an adult thinks. OK. The aircraft's never near the triangle. Absolutely never near the triangle. Anybody tell me why? Because the report's after the event. You're close, but why is the position so far off? What does a boy do when they see something awesome? Pardon? They go out there and they say, awesome, man. Look at that, dude. Oh, oh my god, he's going to be killed. Oh, oh there's a crash boat. Oh, maybe they'll rescue him. Maybe. And what's the instructor doing? Get back in here. We have work to do. But you're going to tell a 19-year-old to stop looking at an awesome crash? So after about 10 minutes, maybe, they go in and they record where they are. It's a long way away from where that aircraft crashed. So adults read that log page and they go search that. Years they called the FBI and said A&T recovered quickly airplane. So the FBI said now we'll check the airplane and we'll see where it is. The aircraft is always behind the position of the ship. So then you have to think about it. How do you know the position of the ship based on the triangle? Anybody figure that one out? It's a Navy ship and a Navy aircraft, what's it doing? It's moving. What direction is it moving? Into the wind. So you have to know the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind. So you can figure out where the ship was when the aircraft was lost. Not where the ship was when the recording was taken. How far from the triangle the furthest one we found away was 12 miles away. <laughs> so if you don't see the position of the wind and you don't know how to figure out the position of the, or the direction of the wind, which way do you look? Right? And that's been the problem with other people. They don't do that. They haven't done that. They didn't do that. Remember I said they recorded all sorts of things? 
About every 15 minutes, they recorded the direction and strength of the wind. So we always knew which way that ship was heading from that triangle, to and from the triangle. Other people didn't do that. Well, are most of the accidents that you've recovered then were the landing accidents or, or uh, takeoff accidents? Or was that where you would find Well, they're them? either a landing or takeoff. Yeah. They, 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 they would have, uh, and, and I, I have had a trap and a cat from an aircraft carrier, but there's a phrase they would use, settled into the groove. Anybody know what the groove is? The groove, it's the behind the ships, right? Well, what would happen is they would, they, they're coming to land, right? So they're, they're pulling back on their throttle. They would get a little too low. And they, no matter what, if they gave it power, they still couldn't get, they couldn't get enough lift to get over the fan tail. So the, uh, the, the landing signal officer would just tell them, that's it. You know, you've settled in the groove, you're too low. I can't have you crashing on the back deck, just go in the water, right? So, so they would go in the water. And then there was, the, there was a couple of uh, fatality accidents where they didn't overcome the P factor, is that it? P factor to torque? And they would, they would be pulled, I think they're pulled to the left, right? Yeah. yeah, pulled to the left so hard over that they would lose their um, lift and you know, wing, one wing, you know, their, their port wing down right into the water. So there was a number of those. And then there was, there was they'd get some odd stuff. They had um, Brian, who's with us, his great uncles, I, I believe that one was a, a, a fuel problem. I believe it was a contaminant in the fuel because it, uh, two aircraft crashed in the water right in a row right after fueling on the deck. And I think they had contaminated fuel. So their engines quit. Um, I'll, I'll roll my film a little more. So one thing I like to do is I like to show you the neat stuff that, um, that I get out of the aircraft. This, by the way, um, this coming up is really cool. You'll see this. You got it. Somebody's got to have a question about this. Huh. You see that? Hawaii. Yeah. So we're real practical jokers. We like to tell practical. We like to pull practical jokes on it, each other and people. Yep. So, <laughs> well, I'm sorry? So they, if he was looking at the airplane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, obviously my crew wasn't. Anyway, but so the, that aircraft, that was one of Fred Turner McDonald's sponsorships. So the director of that museum, which is called the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, we were about to lift the aircraft out of the water. And he said, we got to wait. And I said, why? And he said, well, the, the, the priest and the hula dancers aren't here. So I thought it was a practical joke. I said, yeah, right, I've seen everything, right? No, he was telling the truth. See, the aircraft had been at Pearl Harbor, and it's going to go back to Pearl Harbor for a display, public display. So he, he, he had gotten a priest and hula dancers, mm -hmm. and as we were lifting the aircraft, they, we would stop every now and then, and the priest would say, kahona, kahana, kahana, kahana. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not making fun of it. I just don't speak the language. And... And he would say a, a prayer in the Hawaiian native language. And then the girls would come and, you know, do their dances. And, and we did this for about two hours. <laughs> it was actually kind of fun, right? So, and the way I look at it is, is, you know, America is, well, it was until about a year ago, it was a really interesting cultural place. And to us, that's part of our culture, right? It was a little bit of culture that they incorporated in with the, the whole aircraft. So it was a, a, a lot of fun. And obviously you saw the photographs of my crew and I take advantage of having the pretty girls there with us, which is a rarity, right? Because uh, it's mostly a men kind of thing, right? Anyway, um, but it was a lot of fun. Did you guys notice all the growth on the aircraft? Anybody know what that is? Well, I know muscles partly. Muscles, yeah. First, there was the invaders, the zebra mussels, which they told us wouldn't go deeper than 80 feet. Well, then lo and behold, we start seeing what look like zebra mussels to us at 300 feet. Well, they're just a different variation. They call them guagas. And if you know anything about guagas, guagas went extinct in like 1935. 
they're kind of they were kind of a zebra thing. Uh, these things are unbelievable. They get on everything, and they we found them at 600 feet deep. They are destroying all the shipwrecks and all the aircrafts. And the reason they destroy it is because they excrete they excrete things waste just as we do. They excrete uric acid. So there's gazillions of them all over the air, and they they are destroying them. You can see the damage they're doing. So I want to show you some of the cool stuff. So I'm going to pause the video for a little bit. And I'll tell you a little bit about that, that aircraft. So I like the cool things. So we, um, there's, in the aircraft there's survival kits, right? So theoretically you get shot down in the ocean in the aircraft and you, you're in your life raft and you pull out the life raft and the survival kit. There's some food and stuff. It, survival food, right? This is like my favorite survival food that was in the aircraft, and I'm going to hand this out so you can pass around and look at it. Do you remember when we were young, Horlitz malted milk tablets, candy? You guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had Horlitz malted lunch tablets. It was candy, and just part of the survival kit, believe it or not. Right? So I want you to see this. Now, when I had to take them out because they all kind of deteriorated, but I opened it up. But I want you to see that. And it says uh, Horlitz malted milk lunch tablets. When I was a kid, it was Horlitz malted milk candy. <laughs> it was the same thing. But they put a survival kit. I guess it was something, right? <laughs> How long does it take to do a recovery on average? I know it's different, different situations, but... The... <laughs> Well, you have to find it first, right? And then you have to you have to get the funding in place. Then you have to argue with the Naval History and Heritage Command for years. The permitting process from the states and the Army Corps of Engineers usually takes about three months. So my answer would be fifteen years because fourteen. Years and nine months is arguing with the Naval History and Heritage Command. So how long, though, the actual physical part of, re of uh, recovering the aircraft and bringing weeks. it up? A few weeks. Two weeks? A few weeks, yeah. Well, you know, that's rather interesting because the airplanes, according to some of the records you showed there, the airplane has been stricken. So they no longer belong to the Navy at that it's point. No, true. no, they belong to the Navy. Um, stricken just means that they're not maintaining a record anymore. That's all that means. That's been determined by the courts. Stricken from the records, that's all. They still own it. Um, a question back there. Where do you get the records from? Uh, the National Archives, Records Administration. The National Archives and Records Administration. We, back in 1989, bought all the microfilm of all the uh, crash reports, all the history cards and all the crash reports. Um, as far as ownership, it's pretty simple. It's, it's pretty simple. If you're, if you're going to the Walmart tomorrow and you drop your wallet in the parking lot and you go inside and someone else finds it, whose wallet is it? It's your wallet, right? In our society, in Western society, what we do is if that happens and you have $100 in your wallet, you reach in, you pull out $20 and give it to the person that found it, right? Very similar with anything lost in the water. Ship sinks. Um, whatever, you locate it, uh, there's admiralty laws where vessels in distress. It's similar sort of thing. You, you aid it, they, they, they're, they're grateful and they, they give you something in return. It's not yours. Right? And so um, that's a very simplified of what it is, but it still belongs to the Navy. Now we've been successful in getting the Navy to turn over five or six, maybe seven, of the aircraft to private hands. Actually, they just did it a month ago with the SPD Dolphins, uh, 3175. Um, but they own them. The big problem comes in is they have a branch called the Naval History and Heritage Command that has archaeologists in it. And archaeologists, especially those in the Naval History and Heritage Command, have 
what I call Walter Mitty syndrome. They are people that wish they could be like all of you. All of you have done interesting, exciting, cool stuff working on for whether it was Vought or Lockheed Martin working on missiles or working on aircraft. These people are bureaucrats who sit in a cubicle and write stories about what all people like you do. They dream of being like you. And they are so envious of anybody who does something that's real achievement that their mindset, their collective mindset in their closed college echo chamber is to stop people from doing wondrous great things. So they create this bureaucracy of oppression of anybody who does something that is interesting, exciting, beneficial to the country because they wish they could be those people. But they're the type of people that took the golden handcuffs of the government safety bureaucracy. And we're not going to take it anymore. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what is it? What's the condition of the the airplanes? I mean, do you have to be very careful bringing them up, or oh, are yeah, they, yeah. they pretty well intact? Well, we at A and T Recovery would have been done recovering every aircraft from the lake before 2000, if not for the Naval History and Heritage Command. Okay. They successfully delayed recoveries of aircraft for 15 years, and. We want to recover more, and they are just, they do everything they can. We've caught them lying to state archaeologists. We've caught them, it, there's nothing underhanded enough that they can do to stop us from doing it. They shut down the restoration facilities at the National Naval Aviation Museum to stop recoveries. They have done things that are just, just disgusting and vile. And I'm not, Worried about saying it because it's a fact. They are disgusting, vile people. And the trouble is they have been given a position that's controlling what goes on. And they won't debate me because they can't win the debate. Because it's nothing what they do that logically makes sense, scientifically makes sense. The guagua muscles are destroying all the aircraft. Their head archaeologist actually made a statement to the media years ago where he thought, he made a statement, and I, I'll paraphrase it, he said, won't it be wonderful if we keep these aircraft on the bottom so some archaeologist in 100, 150 years from now can find one when all of this generation has died? That's how this moron thinks. It's disgusting. There's nothing going to be there for anybody to find. Well, maybe they'll find an engine block, but they're, they are willing to keep other people from exploration and doing what you guys do with your, your restorations. They're willing to destroy, allow everything to be destroyed. They'll make nice species because of how they're studying. They're studying the corrosion. Well, we have all these organizations that know about corrosion, NACE and all the rest. To me, it's kind of like if you had a granddaughter that developed leukemia, and you took your granddaughter to a doctor who said they've never seen the progression of leukemia and wanted to watch your granddaughter die of leukemia so he could learn about the disease. That's the kind of mindset these people have. We know what corrosion does. You guys know, you work with them all the time, right? Aircraft underwater are being destroyed, and they, but they, they're gonna tell their peers, who have the same like mind, we're gonna study the corrosion. So the, the fresh water isn't the enemy here, it's the organisms. In this case, it's primarily the organism. Yeah, because it creates the acid bath. All right, I wanna show you some more cool stuff, and then we'll roll a little more film. Is that, is that moving its way? Oh, question, go ahead. Do other services have the same mindset of ownership forever? The Air Force has, a has a different mindset, and the reason the Air Force has a different mindset is they had a big fire and they lost all their records in that fire. So they can't prove their ownership. But the Naval History and Heritage Command, which I believe was illegal, lobbied for a law called the Sunken Military Craft Act, where they claim now that even those Air Force aircraft are under their kind of direction. They lobbied Congress to pass that law. 
And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how these people are. We have recovered one aircraft that had a fatality. We don't mess with aircraft where there's a body in it. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story. But when Duncan Hunter was Armed Services Chairman and they were looking at that, passing that law, I was asked by the Armed Services Committee to talk about it a little bit. And the, the backdrop was that the Navy History and Heritage Command staff had told the Armed Services Committee not to listen to me because I was nothing but a grave robber. <laughs> See what I mean about their lies? Okay. Now the story about the one fatality, Brian Lynch who's with us, it was his great uncle, Ensign McMinn. He had a fuel problem, November, I think 1943, and his aircraft disappeared. He left the ship heading for home and never made it. He went into the lake. We were lucky there was no position on that. We were lucky there was a, a man standing on shore waiting for a business meeting and he watched it occur. The strange part was, I think you guys have been out over water. The, I'll roll the film so, you, so your, your viewers can see more. Um, The man said it was due east of where he was standing five miles. Now, if you, you've ever been on open water, you can't tell distance. You don't have a reference. Anyway, so we went out, we, we went out looking for that aircraft due east of where, where it was, or where he said it was, and we started maybe eight miles out thinking, okay, things appear closer. I'll be damned, that aircraft was five miles from shore due east of where he was standing. I don't know how he could have figured that out. But anyway, so we found the aircraft. I made a solo dive on the aircraft. There was nothing, nothing, nobody in the cockpit. So Ensign McMinn had um, gotten out and then drowned. It was November, so he drowned and went to the bottom and he was never found. So I had to give a presentation. That aircraft is at the Flying Leatherneck Museum. I had to give a presentation for them about that aircraft. So in the process of that, I wanted, I got the records and, and it's, a, it's a very sad, terrible story because the family wanted the Navy to find the aircraft, their, their relative. In 1944, 43, 44, 45, they didn't have the technology where they could find that sort of thing. It took us to somewhere in the 1990s where we found it. So using LinkedIn, I contacted Brian Lynch who was the grand nephew of the pilot and we've become very good friends and um, the um, and he can tell tell more in depth on his family situation dealing with that but it's a very sad story um, anyway so but we don't recover if there's a fatality left in the aircraft that's a grave site I right, have some more cool stuff so Better, battery's getting low so uh, in the survival the kit there was also drinking here water. in the next uh, 10 minutes or so now be careful when I pass this around because there's some sharp edges. But this is a, this is a typical, this is a typical U.S. government thing. There was a couple cans of drinking water in the survival kit, and what I find amazing is they wasted time and money to have put on the can of drinking water property of the U.S. government. Why would anyone care? It's a can of drinking water. You're going to drink it and throw it over. Anyway, but you have to look at it. It's funny. Sunbeam Water Company. Anyway, but it's kind of cool. So, with all this growth on the airplanes, when they start doing the restoration, do they have to do something to stabilize the the metal and material? Uh, this room is full of restorers. I am not a restorer. Uh, probably somebody can answer that much better. I would say the answer to the question is yes, but they can go into much better detail on how they do that and what they do, right? Um, and if somebody wants to answer, go ahead. <laughs> so. I, the answer is yes, right? You, you have to stabilize it, right? Because otherwise it keeps, I, it, to me it's like a tooth decay. If you don't stop it, it keeps going, right? Don't you remove most of the muscles and stuff when you bring it up? Um, you'll see uh, on the film here, that's a bird cage course here, right? And you see it's all covered with guaga muscles, right? What my divers do is when we get into the harbor, they spend several hours 
trying to remove as many as they can. Um, nicely. Stiff brushes, they remove them. And they break off easily, but um, it's the uric acid that's the problem because they coat it and it's just a constant acidic bath. Water is pH of seven acids. Is it lower or higher than seven? I forget. I, mean, I forget which is outgoing. Anyway, so you see, you notice how they, uh, they, they brushed it off. Watch closely what happens to the I'm going to show you how upset I get with things when things go wrong. Watch this. Did you notice how upset I got? <laughs> <laughs> I stepped back. Um, we're very redundant in what we do. That, that sling should have been able to lift about 120,000 pounds and it snapped. So do you tow them, uh, tow them to harbor underwater yes. and then lift yes. them? There's a question there. Well, the question is why do you tow them underwater to the harbor? We knew from seeing other people recover aircraft that if you attempt to recover the aircraft in open water, you will definitely break it. So we do a whole number of things to the aircraft while we tow it underwater. Um, we lighten the load. The aircraft act as a giant filter all those years underwater. It fills with mud. You've got to get that out. So we're able to do that while we're towing it. And then we don't have any wave action to deal with. If you have a wave action, you, you, I don't know what the exact terms for the forces are, but you, if you go up and down, suddenly you have a terrific amount of force. It breaks wings off, things like that. And you, you can't do that stuff. The other thing is you lose oil. If you notice the oil beams, I mean the oil booms, not beams, you, you lose oil almost every time once you're lifting it. It's, kind of, it's funny because the oil is, is staying in the oil reserve. When you pick it out of the water, almost all that tubing and piping will have holes in it. So once you pick it out of the water, the oil starts coming out. Right? When it's in the water, the, the, the oil is floating at the top of the oil reserve. In open water, you can't, you, there's no way to keep those oil booms out. So you, you don't do it in open water. Um, okay, let me show you the next thing. This thing I think is really cool. Um, has any, any of you ever seen a serret of morphine? Nobody. Yeah. Uh, so, any of you ever had morphine? Yeah, I don't okay. think we're catching the word, perhaps. Morphine. 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 The opiate. Morphine. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. I had morphine because I severed my fingers. I can see why people get addicted. If you ever have morphine, it's amazing. Suddenly everything, you're euphoric, nothing's a problem. I had severed fingers. They gave me, they gave me a shot of morphine and I was, ah, oh, I'm going home, everything's fine, it's a mosquito bite. In the aircraft, we find morphine. We find serrets of morphine. And the reason for that is, is, is if you're a pilot and you get hit by something, you give yourself a shot of morphine and it's no big deal to fly that aircraft home. If you're in excruciating pain, you're not gonna be able to do it. So I always think these are cool. I wanna show people what a serreta morphine looks like. Well, folks, and, well, you know, every soldier power on the phone, I'm gonna go ahead and shut this down. So this is out of one of the aircraft. Please don't open it. Um, so I, I have it sealed it in acrylic. And post it to YouTube later on. So thanks for watching. This has gone longer than we anticipated. Very interesting. Appreciate what Taurus is doing here and the Vaught uh, Heritage Foundation. And then, so for now we're gonna sign cultural off, thing, and uh, we will see and you're, you some later. Some of you are far away, you probably can't see it too well.